and you are free to send your questions in many time at any time. Many of you have sent questions when you're registered, and we've been able to hopefully incorporate some of those into uh, the early part of the panel. This webinar is being recorded, and uh, slides in the recording will be posted within 24 hours of the event. Now, turning uh, towards our topic area, I'd like to provide a little background uh, on the work that's being shared today. Today's program uh, was designed to share a new set of recommendations to support the adoption of integration of shared decision-making into behavioral health care. Uh, they were produced by the PCC and funded by PCORI. If you haven't had the opportunity to read the recommendations, you may download them here on the uh, PC, uh, pcpcc.org website. Um, and uh, you'll also get um, uh, an overview of those in just a moment. A review of the existing literature is the way that PCP started its work. They looked at all the existing literature on shared decision making uh, to inform the recommendations, as well as put together uh, subject matter experts uh, to provide input across all the multi-stakeholder uh, work groups or groups of, of uh, clinicians and others. Uh, these recommendations were designed to be disseminated to a range of audiences. PCP ask of you and others that you talk about them and find ways to apply them in the work that you do. It's really important that this information get disseminated, so thank you. If you're a patient advocate, a researcher, a clinician, a policymaker, or something else, we encourage you not only to uh, look at how they apply to you, but share them with your coworkers and others in your network. Um, so that this uh, work, shared decision-making, can really get advanced into practice. Uh, PCP has provided a toolkit with text for your newsletter or social media post that you may just copy and paste, and you'll find those on the landing page with links to the recommendations themselves. So first, we're going to walk through the recommendations and then have a discussion among three panelists about the implications for practice, policymakers, consumer advocates, employers, and others interested in furthering shared decision-making in integrated uh, mental health and primary care practices as well. So with that, I'm gonna introduce our um, speaker, uh, first speaker, Michelle Durst. Michelle is the Director of Practice Management and Delivery System Policy at the American Psychiatric Association where she provides strategic leadership and direction for the policy division. She also manages critical issues ranging from digital health to addiction, privacy policy, and development of clinical practice guidelines. Michelle was an important contributor to the planning committee uh, of this project and the, that produced the recommendations, and she'll now walk us through those uh, recommendations. So welcome, Michelle. Thanks so much, and I want to thank the Primary Care Collaborative for really focusing on shared decision-making and behavioral, behavioral health. This is a, a really important issue, and one, if I could just take a, a few minutes to talk about um, why I've been interested in this issue, and it really goes back to 2007 when I worked for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and they were working on developing um, a, 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 a uh, aid to help with shared decision making and it really resonated with me just a few years earlier I had actually lost my brother to schizophrenia and I say I lost my brother to schizophrenia not to suicide um, because I really feel like he wasn't given the tools to really battle schizophrenia this was early 2000s this was before the the implementation of the mental health parity and addiction act the first before first episode of psychosis before we were talking about person-centered care. And I, and then I think shared decision-making would have been one of the tools that was really helpful for him. And just an example, three quick examples of where um, he really had some insight into what was happening with his schizophrenia. And my brother and I, we were extremely close, so I went on the journey with him, feels like with his schizophrenia and kind of got insight into what he was thinking and what was happening with him. Um, and it was right after he had his first psychotic episode. He was a junior in high in college, and I was a freshman, um, and he was hospitalized after the, the episode, and he went to live with my parents to try and help heal, and I was home visiting him, and he was really frustrated one day, and we were talking, and he said, you know, I've been diagnosed with depression, but I'm not depressed. There's something wrong with my brain. My brain is not working the way your brain works. My brain is working differently, but it's not depression, and he was pretty upset about 
the side effects of the medication. He said that he wasn't able to sleep and he was having really um, nightmares that were very real that, that made it difficult to sleep. And for me, as his sister, I felt really helpless of how can I help him? How can I help him work with his um, clinician? And at that time, another barrier that we had was because of HIPAA and he was an adult, um, we weren't able to really engage in his care. But I think having the tools for him and I um, to help in my family, to help him to engage in his care and be a partner would be helpful. And then a couple of years later, um, he had tried to go back to school and that didn't work out and he had had to drop out. And we were talking again and he, and he tried to explain what he was experiencing. And he said, you know, Michelle, you're able to have long-term goals. You're able to think of what you want to do after college, what you want to do with your life. I struggle to get through each day because of what's going on in, in my head. And, and, I'm having, he was hearing voices, he was having um, paranoid thoughts, he thought people were out to get him, and that made it really difficult. For example, he left his keys in his cars and he thought maybe his professor had done that so he'd missed a class. So really trying to sort through what was real, what was not was really a challenge for him. But again, feeling so helpless because there he was, he wanted to be able to set those long-term goals, but right now he was just trying to survive um, through the day. And then a couple of years later, after he had been um, hospitalized a few more times and he'd had some um, more psychotic episodes and at this point I had just moved to DC and I was doing an internship and he and I continued to stay really close and we talked every night and he um, really took control of his care and he decided that he really thought about what he was consuming both physically and mentally and he at that point had stopped using um, he had been smoking cannabis he'd stopped using cannabis he had stopped drinking he was only eating healthy. And then he really wanted to think about, you know, what, what was going into his, what he was thinking about. And he said, you know, when you and I talk, he set some barriers and said, I want, I don't want any junk going into my head. I don't want any negativity. I have enough that I'm sorting through. Um, I really would prefer for you to only talk about something funny that happened to you during the day. So I might have been the only Congressional Hill staffer who, when I fell in the cafeteria and food flew everywhere, thought that that was the greatest thing because I had a really good story to tell him that night and he laughed so hard. Or he wanted me to just read the Bible with him and we weren't, we weren't a family that usually went to, to church religiously, but it was something that he felt was positive for him and that's how he kind of took control of the disease. And I still think about how he handled it when he was in the throes of schizophrenia and, and just with such admiration with the grace of, of how he handled the disease. And again, what he did to try and um, to fight it with the tools that he had available to him when, to be quite frank, I feel like he was failed by the system and by us as well as family members because we weren't quite sure what to do. Um, but the shared decision making, being engaged in your care, being a partner in your care, I think this is something that what is one of those tools that he could have benefited from, and I'm sure others can. So very much appreciate being involved in this project and really look forward to thinking about how we can advance this effort and scale it up. So with that, I will move to the, the recommendations that we produced and kind of the project that the um, what we did with the project. And as Louise mentioned, we did the Primary Care Collaborative did a great job of summarizing the evidence. They looked at both the domestic evidence and international around behavioral health and shared decision making. So us on the steering committee that came from different backgrounds really had um, the same information and we could identify the opportunities, the gaps when it comes to shared decision making and the evidence. And then um, we hosted a round table and we also shared, we had a webinar prior to the round table with the participants so they could also see that summary of evidence. Um, and then really help for a robust conversation. The meeting was a half a day and we broke up into little groups and big groups um, to have a, a discussion. And out of that round top table really emerged the four themes that our recommendations are centered around that I'll talk about in a little bit. So then we obviously de developed the recommendations. Um, those have been published and now we're working on dissemination. And like what we said, we really encourage you if you see an opportunity with your organization to, to highlight the, the recommendations and to share them, please do so. Please use the, the toolkit. Uh, next slide, please. And here you'll see the members of the planning committee. Um, we had Ann Greiner prim from the Primary Care Collaborative, Crystal Eubanks, Purchaser Business Group on Health, 
Julie Bailey Stino from Humana, Mary Galberte from A Mental Health America, myself and Rachel Adams from Takeda. And just want to thank the planning committee. It was a really thoughtful, dedicated group that had um, was great to work with them over the past year and happy to be here. And also want to acknowledge Alyssa Newman, who was the lead for the primary care collaborative and really kept us on track and did a great job organizing the meetings. And then you can see that we had, um, for the round table, we had uh, a group of multidisciplinary clinicians. We had primary care, behavioral health, pharmacists, as well as payers, employers, and researchers, as well as people with lived experience. Uh, next slide, please. And so looking at the recommendations, the first one was really focused on the culture shift that needs to take place to really help to um, create uh, an environment for shared decision making. And as you can see, it's the recommendation is shift toward a healthcare culture that supports shared decision making and all aspects of care to increase equity and address stigma among patients with, and members of the care team. And, you know, really the first step is making, making sure the culture is there. And that's something that we are moving towards as we talk about creating person centered care. Um, the, Department of Health and Human Services, Office of National Health, National Health, Coordinate, Health Information Technology Coordinator has really been thinking about how do we help patients access their information, take control of their information, and empower patients. Um, so we can see these opportunities and, and now really need to think about what is the role in these opportunities for shared decision making, as well as how do we address different populations, underserved minority populations, um, that um, there might be more stigma related to mental illness. So how can we use shared decision making to help with the communication between clinicians and providers um, so that they really feel a, a part of their team, a, part of their care and can help with the decision making. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, and I also want to mention, too, American Psychiatric on the culture piece. American Psychiatric Association, we really have been working, too, when we release our clinical practice guidelines. We also do a patient and family guide to really help patients understand what are potential treatment options and then use that guide to also um, speak with their clinicians. So we're, we're moving in this direction. Um, and then number two, build on existing innovations and infrastructure to further shared decision-making implementation and broaden training. And what we heard during our round table, especially from the primary care clinicians, is that you know, we're already doing um, shared decision-making for other medical conditions. And so we need to, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to learn what, from what we're doing with other conditions and apply that to um, behavioral health. And we know that there's a real opportunity when it comes to integrated care, just given that most people seek mental health services through their primary care provider. So we need to make sure that the primary care provider um, feels comfortable treating mental health, pr providing mental health services and has that support in place. And important to that is also having that training. And it's training for, for the physicians that are doing direct contact, contact but also the, the whole care team um, that might have interaction with the patient, as well as making sure that we're doing training for family members and, and patients themselves, and making sure that patients are involved in developing that training and have input. Uh, next slide, please. And the number three is advocate for and implement prospective payment models that incentivize the use of shared decision making beginning with a shared definition of shared decision making and related measures. And really, this is thinking about how do we build that infrastructure that help, can help to continue to move us towards that culture. And we know that one of the challenges that, that the evidence shows is that clinicians don't always think they have the time to implement shared decision making. So really think about how do we create, how do we look at the payment models that are available um, and how does shared decision making fit into those those payment models, and how do we get a common definition of shared decision making? Because when you ask, are you doing shared decision making, people might say yes, but there's varying de degrees of shared decision making. So we really need to think about what is that common definition? How do we develop a measure that's related to it? And, and so that we can really think about how, how shared decision making is being implemented, how it impacts outcomes, how we can refine and improve 
And again, what are some of those models, innovative models, prospective payment models that are being implemented and how can shared decision making um, be included? Next slide, please. And then our last recommendation is further develop the evidence base to understand how shared decision making can improve clinical outcomes, experience of care, and patient and clinician satisfaction. And what some of the research is showing is that it's, there is patient satisfaction with implementation of the model, but we need to better understand the, the impact on outcomes. And, and also making sure that when we're doing the research that we have diverse populations included um, and, and that we can really address that stigma again with those different backgrounds, different cultures, and that we're, we're making sure that we're including them in the research. Um, and then also thinking about the role of technology and how can technology help with shared decision making um, and then creating that robust um, evidence base to help to move it forward. So thanks so much, appreciate the time, and I will hand it back over to Louise. Thank you so much for Michelle, uh, for going over the recommendations and sharing your personal story, which really illustrates the impact that shared decision-making can have for patients and families. Um, now I'd like to introduce um, our panelists and welcome them to the virtual stage. Um, all three of these individuals have served among the subject matter experts that contributed uh, to the recommendation development. Uh, by alphabet, I'll go first with uh, Sean Griffin. He's the president and CEO of URAC, a nonprofit uh, um, accreditation organization based in Washington, D.C. Sean began his career as a rural physician in Iowa and Missouri. And before URAC, uh, Sean was vice president for clinical performance improvement and applied analytics uh, at Premier in Charlotte. He has also served as a chief medical information officer and chief quality um, uh, officer uh, for many years in multiple health systems in Missouri and Texas, and was, um, let's see, second, I'm gonna go to Renee. Uh, Renee Marcus Houghton is deputy director of the Center for Consumer Engagement and Health Innovation at um, Community Catalyst, uh, where she works to establish a consumer voice at all levels of the healthcare system in order to make it more responsive to consumers, particularly those who are the most vulnerable. Renee's expertise extends to other areas of healthcare, including hospital free care and community benefits and healthcare uh, conversions. Renee um, was also uh, a, a part of the original uh, group that developed recommendations. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Jared Skillings is Chief of Professional Practice at the American Psychological Association, uh, where he leads national efforts, efforts to increase access to high quality psychological services and science, de science, develop best practices in the mental health field and promote the leadership and specialty services of psychologists and advance population health and health equity. Dr. Skillings is a licensed uh, clinical psychologist and prior to joining uh, APA, his clear career included senior leadership roles in large group practice settings and complex integrated health systems. Okay, so I think we're ready to get started. And um, a first question I have, I'm going to uh, direct to you, Jared. And could you clarify for us what integrated behavioral health care means? I know for myself, coming from the purchasers, I often sector, I often think I understand terms, especially when they sound simple like that. But maybe there's some nuance there that that we all should know. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for, and thank you, Louise, for being willing to moderate this and for the for the group um, who put the leadership into developing these shared shared decision making principles. And maybe I can just also add to what you said too, Louise, is I was touched by the story that Michelle told about her brother and really want, I really appreciate having the, the human connection rather than uh, just thinking about policy and um, statements, but uh, that's really important. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, let me offer a comment about integrated care so at the highest level, integrated care really is about the connection between the physical health and the mental health side of things. Um, we all know that people are whole people. We have biological, psychological, social, cultural, and spiritual aspects. And usually we call that the biopsychosocial way of talking about people. And integrated care is really about connecting those ways of providing care. Um, there are actually several models to do that. I won't get into the, the weeds about how to do it. Some of the most evidence-based ones are putting a mental health clinician right alongside the physical health clinicians. And so 
you really have a psychologist or a counselor who really works hand in hand with the primary care doctor. There's some psychiatry consultation models that are important too. And so it's really about connecting the, the healthcare providers to take care of um, the, the whole person. Great, thank you so much. Um, recommendation one talks about shifting culture. Um, probably uh, a little bit harder than, than it sounds, but um, Renee, what do you think about um, shifting uh, the culture in healthcare to better support shared decision-making in all aspects of care? Sure, thanks for the question. Um, and I just wanted to echo uh, what Jared said about uh, Michelle's personal story. Personal stories are so important uh, to make this, these policy issues real, and we couldn't do it without those um, important real life experiences. I also just wanna say how thrilled I was to be part of this round table um, that, that brought th these recommendations into reality. Um, there's so much in there that uh, I think reflects the kinds of ideas that I and others uh, that represent um, the you know patients and family members uh, brought to the table. So I'm so grateful that uh, to the group who really put this together for um, reflecting those. So. So back to your question, Louise, um, the culture shift. Yeah, I think that that was such a critical recommendation because it doesn't just start with social, I'm sorry, with um, shared decision making. It really starts with a broader culture of kind of what a lot of people um, hear is you know, that nothing about us without us um, uh, approach, which is, again, it's not just about using shared decision making in those kind of critical moments where decisions do need, need to be made, but it is really stepping back and kind of creating a broader person-centered approach overall. Um, I was also really um, uh, grateful that uh, this paper ended up incorporating so much about um, patient and family engagement and not just kind of voice, um, but especially around um, co-creation. I think that's a really part, a really important part of creating culture. Um, getting more to the shared decision making um, when it comes to individual uh, individuals' care and um, decisions, um, it's really in my mind about flipping the script um, and asking earlier on um, about goals. Um, and, and you know, I think understanding. Um, what a, the patient's goals are um, allows for a set effective shared decision making with the patient um, because it really helps people to align uh, and providers to help um, patients to align the um, decisions with the uh, highest priorities in their life. And that's not just about their care um, and the clinical outcomes, but rather, you know, what's important to them in their lives. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and, and, and let others uh, uh, add to that, um, and I'll come back later. So, so Sean, you wanna jump in and maybe share what um, you think the shared responsibility across stakeholders might be for shifting the culture? Well, I, I think that as the primary care doc uh, who used to sit in a little office by himself and, and think about integrated behavioral health care, which meant I had to cover it because there, there weren't services in my area. You know, when we talk about culture, uh, years ago, and you, you can argue about how many years ago it was, you know, the doctor said, this is what you do, and the patient did it. And to doctors, that was a really nice way to exist. It really got you through your day a lot faster when you, when you just sort of told everybody what to do. But we see the flaws in that, and we see, we see the power dynamics that are so unbalanced and health literacy differences and those sort of things. I, I think that when we, come, when we approach shared decision making, we really have to understand that there needs to be a place of trust. Because if you don't trust the person that you're sharing the decision making with, it doesn't matter what the decision is, you don't trust it anyway. And, and we talked about personal stories. And, and one of the stories that really brought the idea of shared decision making home for me is my mother was in the hospital and I flew back and she had been diagnosed with an advanced disease. And I flew back and I had my whole backpack full of what we do to treat this disease. And, and, and I was just loaded for bear and I, I come rushing into the room. And, and in that moment, I asked my mom, I said, mom, what really matters to you? And, and she looked at me and it wasn't about treatment plans. and It wasn't about all the various things that I was equipped to discuss. It was about, I really want to get back home to my farm and be in the place where I feel good. And, and, and I had to empty my backpack full of expectations and plans and say, well, that's really what matters. And I think that shared decision making, whether it be in behavioral health, whether it be in diabetes, whether it be in other diseases, is about the doctor saying, 
I have these things that I can bring to the table, but if it's not the menu that you want to have in this moment, it doesn't matter. And I think that the culture change and the, the dynamics that change when we say it's it's not always about the science, it's not about the efficacy, it's it's about you know the person who is non-compliant very often it's because they're unconvinced, and and you need to have the conversations and you need to have the freedom and the trust to to let them be part of the care decisions that affect their life much more than than your you know, academic background. Jared, you want to add anything to the culture discussion? Um, that, that was an excellent couple of points. Um, the only thing, I'll make this real brief, the, the, the only thing I wanted to highlight was just the point about trust. Um, I, I would just add intentionality. I think when you think about doing this, you really have to make as a clinician a point or an administrator or a family member a point to make sure that you don't, as Renee said, no decisions about us without us. So make sure um, you really focus on that. It, it, takes some, it takes some effort, as Sean's example just explained, that's right. Yeah, thank you. That's a great lead into my next question. I'm curious, Renee, representing consumers and family uh, of pa patients and their families, what do they need to know? How should the clinicians out there talk about or introduce this concept of shared decision making uh, to patients so that they recognize it and know their role? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think first and foremost, I keep going, you know, up here to say, you know, people are experts in their own lives, thinking about, you know, Sean's backpack full of expertise. Um, you know, what the person, you know, in the bed or uh, in front of you in the clinical space is, is an expert on is what's in their own life. And so I 100%, you know, support what uh, Sean said about, um, you know, finding out what matters. It goes back to, as I said, goals um, that we talked about. So again, that's that's first and foremost about what what um, patients and families need. Um, I, I think the other thing that they that they need is they need people who look like them um, talking to them about these decisions and people who understand their culture. And so, th to me, that that's really um, calls for. Um, uh, the staff, and again, not just their individual provider, but the you know front desk people, anybody who's interacting um, with patients, to be educated in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But uh, even more so, training in what's called cultural translation, um, which really teaches people and organizations how to center cultural competency, um, cultural agility, and cultural humility, actually, um, uh, with the intention of increasing equity and sort of addressing that unconscious bias, which I think is uh, part of uh, uh, part of these conversations and for, in medicine too long. Um, and to acknowledge too that knowledge kind of comes in many forms um, and going back to that point earlier that people are experts in their own lives. Um, you know, some other more specific things, um, certainly training and decision aids um, are, uh, are really important. There's a lot out there. There's some really good stuff that SAMHSA put out. But I think it matters you know, who is doing the training and who is introducing those decision aids. Um, and if they are going back to my point around, you know, uh, equity and cultural translation, you know, using um, alternative staff such as community health workers, um, peer uh, uh, peer specialists, um, health coaches, and using plain language and making sure, speaking of language, making sure that um, materials are in that person's own language, um, I think is going to go a long way to um, giving uh, patients and family members the tools that they need and in the ways that they need it to build the trust um, that uh, was uh, talked about earlier. So let me stop there and Great. let the Thank other folks talk Thank about it. Um, so, you know, you really bring up um, things that, that the clinician can do, and I was just curious, you know, so much of healthcare transformation has fallen um, uh, to primary care teams, and Sean, I wanted to know what we've learned from the patient-centered medical home that might be able to translate uh, to advancing um, shared decision-making in behavioral health care. Well, I think the patient-centered medical home is, is a very interesting comparison. I, I don't think it's a one-for-one -one sort of aspect. 
because the, the patient-centered medical home, a lot of the focus was in changing the processes, changing the, the teams, changing some of the organization within the office, which I, I think is a good lesson to have. But you have to understand also that, that when, when it comes to this, you know, your primary care office is usually a pretty darn busy office. And, and if you want to be successful, you need to simplify the ask for these organizations. You know, you want to make sure that, that they understand the elements of team-based care so it doesn't just fall on the provider. You want to make sure they have the tools so, so that it's easily accessible. You know, if you're going to use uh, documents, if you're going to use educational aids, they need to be in all the offices. If you're, if you're going to, um, you know, work on the culture, you, you also need to give people time. One of the things that we don't talk about is you can trust somebody, but if you feel like a decision is rushed, you, you, you tend to, to worry more about it. You tend not to buy in as much. So understanding how time factors into that and how that factors into a busy primary care office. And, and don't just go in with the, here's the new flavor initiative of the month for the organization. And if you just stay still long enough, it's gonna go away. This, this really needs to be where there, there are champions, where there are, are, are physicians who, who, have, who are leaders and showing the way to do this and there's support and it's ongoing. And, and you know, physicians are resistant to change, especially if they feel like it's a waste of time. So don't forget to talk with them about how this type of initiative will improve care, how it will increase compliance, how it will help them with some of the behavioral issues that maybe they've been ignoring in their practice, maybe not actively ignoring, but that they're only seeing the side effects of it and how it spills into other conditions. And, and emphasize that this is this is not something that's some fringe theory that's never worked anywhere. I mean, to all the people on the webinar, I would say, take a look at all the resources that are referenced within the recommendations. I mean, there's hundreds of pages of information. And if you go into that, and if you look at what's out there, you can see some of the lessons that will save you some of the owies that you would otherwise run into as you try and do this. But, but get the champions, do the support, make it an ongoing initiative, and celebrate your successes because the stories that we tell very often influence the care that we give. And when you really connect with somebody and you see it make a difference in an individual's life, you know, unfortunately we, we have great stories of tragedies that have happened when the care doesn't align, but sometimes a story where the care aligns and there's a success can, can power people through months of frustration. I really like that, Sean. Um, one of the things that um, PC, PCC did was invite uh, registrants to ask questions and there were a lot of questions about well you know make this real like what's the best life you know what, what are the real life examples that we can use and how do we put this in place so I think you've done a good job of giving some ideas about tools and things that practitioners can do uh, does anyone have any best case examples for engaging patients um, and uh, a, a good case study story that is uh, could be shared I'm, I'm happy to offer one. Um, actually, I wanted to just say first, I actually love the way that Sean just described how to talk to PCPs. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the flavor I got from how he described it was almost suggesting a shared decision-making approach with the clinicians, just like we're talking about with patients. A very collaborative, a very respectful discussion about how to engage clinicians, about how to change practice in the same way we're talking about with patients too. I, I love that. Um, Oh, look, I'd, I'd be glad to offer a story too. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think I shared with our panelists when we were sort of prepping for this um, that I lost my father to COVID earlier this year. Um, it was uh, really, really difficult. And um, he got sick like so many folks who were in that position do um, quickly, over a weekend in fact. And so he, got, he went into the hospital and his, uh, his medical condition went downhill very quickly. Um, and we were in the spot where he was either really probably in the last couple of days of his life or we were going to try to put him on a ventilator really as almost emergency care. And the medical staff, it's actually a very small rural hospital in rural southern Ohio where I grew up. So I want to give a shout out to the uh, Adena Medical Center if anybody, I don't know if anybody's on here, but um, they did an excellent job. In fact, um, they, they immediately brought in not, not just the intensive hospitalists, but they actually brought in a couple other folks. They actually brought in a couple of people who do palliative care and they had a really very holistic team-based conversation. Um, they called my mom and had a conversation with my father. Long story short, essentially what happened is that he told them he did not want to go on a ventilator. And um, honestly, that was shocking to us. We thought my, my sister took that the hardest and said, oh no, he's giving up, um, what does that mean? Uh, she, was, she wanted to fight, fight, fight. 
Um, and so we all had this really helpful medical family conversation. I had to do the same thing Sean did. I had to take my back. I, I staffed the uh, intensive cardiac unit for years as a psychologist. And so I had to put all of this like healthcare medical stuff in the back burner and say, we're going to have a conversation about what dad wants and what's the right medical thing and the personal thing for him. And um, I, the, the piece I'll end on, uh, although he passed away, the, the whole conversation and that medical team um, were very intentional about asking first um, and last and the whole time what's the best thing for him and what's consistent with his values and who he was as a person. And that made the whole process, while it was terrible, it's, it's still terrible. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, made it, it made it so much better because everyone could feel like they had trust in the process. And now even months later, none of us have regrets that everyone was included in the process. It genuinely felt shared and collaborative and respectful the whole time. So a shout out to those people who were really um, very intentional about including that. Well, wow. thank you very much for sharing that, Jared. I'm sorry to hear about your dad and I was taken yeah, in the end that people don't have regrets because so many times family members do have regrets. And so that's another, I think, opportunity of engaging everyone in the conversation. Renee, did you want to add something to that? Just a couple of um, specific tools that I thought um, were particularly helpful. Um, so uh, these are materials that are much more around goal, uh, you know, eliciting goals and documenting goals and sort of making decisions in line with those goals. So again, sort of stepping up just from the from the shared decision making. Um, I, you know, NCQA, uh, National Committee for Quality Assurance, has done a really a nice job on some of their um, care to goals work. Um, like there are scripts in there, there's some really nice materials. So I'd recommend people to check those out. And then, even though this is um, much more around um, older adults, I really recommend um, the age friendly health systems work um, that is. Um, uh, the locus of it is in uh, the IHI, uh, and uh, they talk about the four M's, and one of them is what matters. And there's been a lot of attention paid to how to figure out what matters um, to people, um, uh, you know, not just in the moment, but overall. And I think, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, similarity in terms of the questions that, um, that Jared was just uh, talking about in the context of his own family. So I recommend people check those out. Louise, we, let me just throw in something else also. I, I would say to everybody to check with their societies for their, their specialty societies, because very often their specialty societies have recognized the need for tools into these spaces and have some of their own work. And sometimes that's really going to give you the, the evidence that you need to bring back to your organization to say, here is another you know, internal medicine office that approached it and here's some of the tools that they used. And, and sometimes physician offices can get to where they wanna see somebody just like them who did this and was successful before they'll buy into it. So sometimes that will give you some additional information uh, that can help change that conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, all of you have made comments that help us understand that it isn't one size fits all. Shared decision-making varies uh, across different people and groups of people. Um, and probably especially those populations with certain medical conditions or that have been marginalized in the past. So what can we do to reduce barriers to shared decision-making such as implicit bias um, or patients' own stigma about themselves or their condition? Uh, anyone wanna jump in first? Uh, Renee? Sure. Um, a lot, a lot of the things that I was thinking about um, uh, in response to this question really are things that I mentioned before. So I'll more underscore what I said before. Under, I think it was under the culture change question you asked earlier, um, in terms of you know using uh, alternative uh, providers, um, the uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, but really um, even more than that, cultural um, trans. Uh, training that has to get into you know the roots of racial inequities in the healthcare system so and in the systems overall so I really encourage those there's a great organization that uh, we've worked with um, called the Cultural Wellness Center they're out of um, Minnesota and uh, I think that I highly recommend those sorts of um, uh, conversations, deeper conversations, uh, as a means to reduce those barriers. Great, thank you. 
Okay. Well, we, um, let, me just, let, me, let me throw in one other comment on this. Uh, we, we've talked about a lot of different things that we can do. I, I also want to say that there needs to be a time to listen. You know, yeah. you, you really you really need to to make sure people are equipped, that they're educated, that they understand some of the, the factors that come into this. But then, as a provider, you need to give them time to process it, and then you need to listen to them. It needs to be a conversation. It can't just be a data dump, and then you you lock them in a room and say, "I'll, I'll come back in five minutes and tell me your decision." It really should be a conversation because you know, e even people who you think you connect with or you you think are more like you than are different from you may have different things that matter to them. And really having that conversation, you may find out things, you know, ideally you're not having this conversation for the first time when they're, when they're in the ICU and you have to make really important care decisions. Hopefully it's part of that ongoing relationship. As a PCP, I, I knew my patients and my patients knew me and they could talk to me about anything. And sometimes they did. And that was both good and that was surprising at times. Um, but it really built that relationship. So, so I think that shared decision making ideally is with people that you trust and how you build that trust is unique to your culture, is unique to your location, is unique to your situation. But don't, don't go it alone. You know, the, the most important person in the patient uh, provider interaction is the patient. That's why you're both there. And if you don't listen to them, you're missing out on more than half the story. Yeah, uh, I think that's... I think that's right. I was gonna um, pick up on the stigma word. There's a very significant stigma still, particularly on mental health issues. Um, I, I just wanted to flag that as something that's important. Um, but I, I also wanted to highlight in addition to that, um, there, there's also some stigma. We don't use this word, maybe stigma or bias that clinicians or systems have. So what I would also say is um, if you're working with patients don't make assumptions about the person sitting across from you because they even whether they look like you or have the same values or life that you do or not, they may look at the world in a very different way. They may look at it in the same way, but it's really important to not assume and put the same kind of values you may have for your family, your life on the person or the family that you're working with. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to shift to policy. Uh, so I think we all uh, know one of the recommendations is really supporting uh, policy change and, and payment change. Um, it seems that the transformation we seek in advancing shared decision making uh, would in, be enhanced by these policy changes. Would, you, would any of you like to make a recommendation for the policy, those on the call that have the opportunity to influence policy um, as to what that might look like, or even any payment models that you think best support shared decision making. I have one high level thought maybe to start the conversation, which is when we think about what shared decision making is, shared decision making is a conversation. Um, shared decision making is also thinking. It takes the clinician some thoughtfulness about um, really laying out what kind of care options might be available. I mean, Sean used kind of the description of like a menu style. You have to really think through how to how to organize and present that. So there's a lot of cognitive work and planning that goes on. Um, and frankly, collaboration. The difficulty is that the system we have now doesn't pay for much of that. Um, there is some, There are some ways to get paid for having a direct conversation, but the collaboration between professionals and collaboration with other family members, not just the, the identified patient, but collaboration with other family members or other important people in the family's life, a lot of times those things are not reimbursed and it's just up to the, the healthcare provider or the, uh, the system to sort of eat those costs. If the federal government, if payers genuinely care about really advancing this work and making whole person care um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a respectful, collaborative, shared way truly available, you need to make sure that your um, that your values, your pocketbook follows your values, and that includes reimbursing for those kind of services too. One th one thing I would add to that is uh, lately we've been working a lot with employers because employers are seeing the value of integrated behavioral health care or you know advanced primary care uh, practices and those sort of models. And I'm saying if the if the clinicians are saying the payers aren't valuing it, the employers need to tell the payers to value it. And, and think about different models, whether they be risk-based contracting, whether they be incentives, those sort of things. There are ways to do it. And, and if, if, if no one is doing it, no one will do it. And, and that's the problem with providers. If you're on a fee-for-service treadmill and I wanna tell you that you need to implement shared decision-making, you're thinking of the time that you lose 
and the next patient that you don't see, which the, the research doesn't truly support that. There, there is research out there that says that it's not a, a time well that just sucks up your day. So, so please look at that research, but also just even implementing change in a primary care practice should be rewarded if it's advancing care and our policies and our payment structure should follow that. Excellent. I just want to remind the audience that we're going to be taking questions from the audience in a few minutes. So I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll shift to the audience questions. And that I is, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we go off of policy, I was hoping just add a couple of things in, if, if yeah. we have a moment or two. Great. So, you know, I, I think um, just to, to get really specific, you know, I think that Sean just said, you don't do it if you don't do it. We well, don't do it unless you're kind of required to do it <laughs> as well. Um, and sometimes that can change practice. And so, you know, from our, our perch, um, you know, I think we'd love to see, you know, requirements written into things like, you know, any models that come out of, you know, the centers uh, for Medicare and Medicaid innovation or CMMI or, you know, uh, new contracts for Medicaid managed care or uh, for ACOs, uh, federal care organizations. So I think those can be written in uh, together with, you know, measures um, in order to show that, you know, you don't, Nothing. It doesn't matter if you don't measure it. So if we measure it, then we know it's it's um, going to matter, and it'll get some um, attention. And then the the last thing I would say is that um, you know again from our perch and thinking about um, lower income populations um, and historically excluded populations, I think you know investing in um, shared decision making. Um, in places that serve those populations, so, such as you know community health centers or community mental health centers, making the investments there would make a really big difference when it comes to um, populations who need this, uh, perhaps even more so than others. Good point, thank you. I think I'll go ahead and go to the audience questions then. So um, Sean and Jared, there's a question here that says, can you talk about the need for breaking down communication barriers of communications between primary care uh, clinicians and mental health providers so that all can be on the same page. <laughs> go ahead, Jared. You're up first. Okay. I was going to ask if you wanted to go. Um, great. That, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Um, based on some of the updates that have happened, um, it's his historic, historic, let, me, let me back up one step. Historically, there had been some regulations that really um, emphasized patient safety and patient confidentiality and swung the pendulum so far that direction that it in fact made it difficult to in fact honor patients health care and health in a shared way some of those have been fixed over over recent years and um frankly with the signing of a simple form for sharing information um within a healthcare system it's very easy nowadays to do that but even between independent clinicians and a larger healthcare system usually that kind of information should be readily available. Um, mm -hmm. So what I would encourage any clinicians on the um, on the call to pay attention to is to make sure that when patients come to you and ask you for that kind of shared information, that you actually do it. It takes some effort on our part to be able to ask either administrative staff or to do it yourself to get their records sent over and to provide updates. But in terms of helping um, primary care, helping specialty care keep track of mental health issues, that's such an important thing. And I'm, I, I suspect Sean would say the same thing in, uh, in reverse too. Gosh, I hope so. Um, yeah. One of the things that I would say <laughs> is, that, is that for years, the division between behavioral health care and regular health care created, created false divisions among certain providers. And, and if you look, there are some good examples of, of co-location or collaborative agreements that have helped to bridge some of those divides. But just like our relationship with a patient takes time and it takes trust, it's going to take time and trust between different providers to build a relationship where the, where the patient can be at the center and they can be working together and not be, be put at odds with one another. So, so there's things around, you know, uh, a payment for behavioral health treatment in, in primary care that needs to be reimbursed at a fair level. There needs to be collaborative agreements and those sort of things that, that need to come together. But, but when you when you actually take on the health of a population and whether you take on the health of a patient, you understand that you can't just treat their medical in a little box and expect them to do well. You have to treat the whole person and whole person care is what primary care has been about, is about. And, and I think that we need to continue to, to break down the barriers between us and the patients and us and other providers so that we're, we're playing nice with each other so that, so that the patient wins. 
We have a, a question from someone that would like advice on implementing shared decision making in, in a youth uh, and kids, uh, particularly if the parents and the kids' goals aren't aligned. That's a good one. I'm sure that happens all the time. Huh? <laughs> Any, Absolutely. any thoughts on that, Jared? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to kick that off. Um, that that's a much more complex situation because it, it fr frankly, to really get into the to, to the weeds, you'd need to like pull up the the situation. For for example, different states have regulations. If it's about the child's sexual health, for example, different states have different ages when the child is allowed to have an independent consult with a health provider. Um, for for those kinds of issues. If let, let, let me let me come up with a, a non-legal sort of sort of issue. Um, let's say, for example, you have a child. I'll make it a primary care and mental health issue. Let's say you have a kiddo who has diabetes, and they also they're struggling to take their medication um, and, and to follow the diabetes regimen on a regular basis. Oftentimes, you might actually consult a psychologist to try to help. Um, so you'd have the primary care doctor and then a psychologist working together with the family. Um, I've seen a few kiddos, um, teenagers, for example. Because you're having to take insulin shots during the day, especially at school or other places, it, there, there's a stigma around that. And the kid can feel weird or like they're different or like there's something wrong with them or they can't eat the ice cream sundae or that kind of thing like the other kids without taking a shot. So that's the kind of thing where you really have to I, – I can't give specific clinical advice without having more details. But what, what I would say is it's just the same way we're talking about looking at having a respectful collaborative relationship with an individual patient, you got to make sure that that exists with the, the teenager, the parents, and that you might have to coach the parents to like figure out how to work with their kid in a really collaborative way rather than just try to boss the kid around, which might work at five years old. That's still not great at five, but it might work at five. It definitely doesn't work at 15. So, so as a dad who has five sons who have, who have all been teenagers and have now graduated out successfully, um, it, as a provider, you need to know the laws that apply in your area. And, and right. if, you know, if you know the laws as they apply, sometimes you're going to blame the laws for doing the right thing. And, and that may be, you know, I've told parents before, I've said, you know, legally, this person has, has the right to their own care and I, I can't share it with you. And, and so the law, I, I use the law as my backstop even when it's the right thing to do, just to, to end the argument. But I also want to have a conversation with the parents about the fact that you can't control a teenager in everything that they do. And that trust in the relationship with their doctor is probably pretty important for their better health. And, and, and you don't want to get in the way of that as a parent. So we have a question as to whether there are any uh, conditions, mental health conditions, um, that really prevent shared decision making. The, well, the, the ones the, that the, oh, go ahead, oh, Jared. You first. No, no, no. I, I was going to say that the literature review that was done for part of developing the guidelines even talked about shared decision making in in forced hospitalizations. Yes. And, and they gave guidance for for how how to do in a situation where you think there'd be no trust, where there would be be no way for shared decision making. There's examples as to how they have approached it, and then they talk about how challenging it is. But, but if you can have somebody who's involuntarily confined and you're working on shared decision making, I have trouble coming up with other other conditions where, where you can't find a path. I, I was going to say the same thing. As, I, I was going to say the same thing. And I was going to say, I, I suspect that what the person's thinking about is a situation where the suicide risk is or homicide risk is like really, really high and is a hospitalization or or, for example, Michelle's example um, of a, a psychosis where the person is having such difficulty staying in touch with reality. Forgive me, Michelle. I don't know your brother and where that where that was at, but that 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 example came to mind. But in all of those examples, just like Sean was saying, there are ways to be collaborative and to use shared decision making. Um, I'll give you one personal example. So I've had to hospitalize a couple of people, or several people, over my career, and if they have to get to the emergency room or the hospital to be officially evaluated to be uh, hospitalized, there are, for example, multiple ways to get there. You can have another person take them. The ambulance can take them. There may be other ride sharing options. So you don't have to just make decisions for the person. Um, even if even if there's a certain outcome that has to be achieved from a risk management perspective, there are different ways to get there in a, in a collaborative way. Um, 
Final question. Um, so this is all about, in this work, advancing shared decision-making and integrated behavioral health. If we were gonna publish an annual report that really um, looked at our progress as a nation, what do each of you think would be the top couple of measures that would be on that annual report? What would we measure to know how we're doing? Any ideas? I mean, going back to goals, you know, uh, measuring how often goals are elicited, put it in, put into the person's record, and then uh, uh, used in a in a way that um, uh, with any decisions. So make sure that the the care is provided to those goals. So I would say you could easily measure elicit elicitation and documentation very easily. Yeah, I would say classically, you see, first off, you start off with process measures, then you move to outcome measures as you get some progress. I think that, that early measurement of, of, of team-based care, of shared decision-making, tool utilization under certain conditions where they're appropriate, uh, tying that to outcomes, being able to compare it across an organization for places where you're doing shared decision-making versus not doing shared decision-making, probably some, some measures of patient satisfaction in participation in shared decision-making in clinics where it's being done versus where it's not being done would be some good measures. Just off the top of my head. Any anything else anyone wants to add? Any final comments? Well, this isn't a, this is in answer to the question about measurement, though it's not a measure per se. I just wanted to return back to where I started, which is um, uh, the theme running through these recommendations around um, co-creation. And so, you know, the measures ideally would be co-created with uh, a group of patients and families that the practice or delivery system would bring together. Um, so, you know, we may all come up with some brilliant ones here, but I bet uh, asking the people who um, the practice serves um, for their ideas about what, what's most important to measure would get you where you wanna be. Great, well, th thank you all very much. I think this has been uh, a really great conversation. I hope it's been helpful to all of our participants and uh, those that really uh, want to uh, adopt shared decision-making and advance that uh, in their clinical practice. Uh, so um, Sean, Renee, and uh, Jared, thank you so much for bringing your personal expertise to our conversation today. Thanks uh, to PCC uh, and PCORI uh, for creating this opportunity for all of us. And again, thanks to everyone who attended the program uh, and all, all of your future efforts that uh, audience will have to uh, implement this and to share the word. So as a reminder, uh, the recording is uh, will be on the website in 24 hours as the materials uh, that were discussed earlier. And we encourage everyone to please share this, have a discussion with your colleagues and share your best practices and tell your stories. Uh, so all, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. You, thank you, Louise. Excellent job as a moderator. Thank you. Okay, I think that ends our program.